is a Bramble Jam podcast. Hi, I'm Bran, and if I had to choose, I would pick Christmas movies that were released after 1992. I'm Alonzo, and I'm here to instruct Bran that there was a cinema before he was born, and this is the Tech Dog Mark Podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Week five, Alonzo. Woo. Week five. We are. Uh, what? What is that? A, a, a fifth? A fifth of the way there? Is that my? Yes, twenty percent. Man, how about that? Look at us go, <laughs> just chugging along. Um, we are obviously for those of you that maybe haven't joined us for whatever reason. Alonzo is letting me know of a movie that I should watch. It was uh, came out before nineteen ninety two that I haven't seen before. And um, the next week, I'll tell Alonzo a movie that he should watch that came out after 1992 that he will likely dislike. And uh, but that's not the goal. The goal is not no, to find no. a movie that he dislikes. It's just to either, you know, either to introduce me to one or to bring me around on something. That's exactly that I, right. I didn't get the first. Time. And so far, I'm 0 for two. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I got a good feeling. Oh, you know, you're you're having a good time here. I I'm hope. having a great time, buddy. I'm having a great time. <laughs> um, let's. Uh, but but on the 25th week, we are going to be doing a um, viewer user, short, a user recommended uh, yeah. one. And uh, I saw a comment that we should. Uh, I, I haven't seen this, but I, it's like lore at this point, which is uh, what. Is it Santa, Santa and the Martians? Santa, Santa Claus conquers the Martians. Santa Claus. Cla- <laughs> Somebody recommended that one. I've always heard about it, and so I'm going to put it in the back, the back pocket, because okay. uh, I think it's a a, a good uh, compromise. Because it did come out before 1992, and it also sucks. So uh, <laughs> it could be a really good. Uh, but yes, we're open to other votes. Please vote. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I got to ask you, um, I should uh, I should have asked you last week, but I, I didn't. A Christmas story reboot. Where are you yeah. at on that? Because we talked about the Santa Claus reboot and we're sure. both like, I, I am much, you know, I'm pretty optimistic in general, but I'm all in on that. Christmas story reboot, Peter Billingsley. I am all in on that. And uh, and seventy is very intrigued by what they're going to do there. So, what 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 is your take on it? I mean, you know, I want to believe like uh, like like Fox Mulder. Um, I, we've been down this road before, as you know. There have been already several attempts to do sequels, follow ups to a Christmas story, and they've all been kind of not great. But you know, not with was, Peter Billingsley. But not with Peter Billingsley. Granted, that's the thing. And, and he's a producer. He is. Producer. And, and the fact that he doesn't have to do this like clearly he's he he's found other fish to fry over the course of his career so if he can get talked into doing this again it would have to be because the script is so good so yeah i hope that's the case i i i have like i said i want to believe i you know and i think we talked about this 8-bit christmas already kind of feels like it's the more modern follow-up to a christmas story but you know again with peter billingsley now that could make the difference but it's modern, but seventies. So it's not True. like so. That was eighties. That was eighties. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll see we'll see what happens there. Uh, but I didn't know that Peter Billingsley was like partners with Vince Vaughn with a. I, I had no idea that was a thing. Yeah, he and John Favreau have have worked together quite a bit, and in fact, um, you know, like I think. Um, I think that he is a producer on like Iron Man. Like, oh, really? Know? Yeah. He directed them in that movie Couples Retreat. So he's, you know, he's, he's done a lot of, he, he's much more like on the producing a- angle of things now. Uh, so for him to, you know, he did that cameo in Elf, but for him to come back to play the lead and to, to reprise his, you know, most famous role, uh, I don't think he would do that out of like, oh, I need the check. I think he's doing it out of like, oh, this is a cool project and I, I want to do it. I hope that's what's happening here. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm excited because he's going to be playing the dad. So he's going to like how much like his old man will he be? Sure. You know, that's always interesting to see. Is I've Ralphie also, now Ralph? You know, yeah, is he Ralph? <laughs> and the movie is filming in Hungary, which I found yes. to be very odd, but. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess if you want sort of like, if, if you want it to look like seventies Detroit, Hungary, you know, <laughs> Eastern Europe is the place to be now. I don't, I don't really know. I, I do know, like, I mean, Hungary is, uh, being currently getting famous for some civil rights abuses, which, uh, I, I certainly hope that movie studios like pay attention to before they start sending productions over there willy nilly, but I, that's neither here nor there. I can, there's just so, I don't see any 
pros to doing that. There's like, you know, go to Canada. Like the well, first one was filmed in Canada. I believe. Yeah, I mean, so. the actual house that that it was in is in the U.S. Like has been, you know, turned into a museum and has been lovingly restored to look exactly the way it does in the movie, inside and out. So I would imagine that's going to be a location at least. Yeah, here's here's hoping. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's get to your movie. Uh, we've been in 1940 for what seems like a, 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 a few, you know, a few hundred years. So let's see what happens. Where, how far into the future are we going now? We are taking a big leap forward to Whoa. 1944. Whoa, boy! 1941 through 43 can kick rocks. Those That's years, right. Those years so, sucked. Got no use for you. That's now right. I, I, this one is is legitimately like considered an American classic. And I, I do think I, I'm almost positive that you will really love it. If there's any issue you might have with it is that it is not Christmas from stem to stern. Uh, it is, it is kind of a year in the life movie. Okay. The Christmas, there's a Christmas section where a lot of memorable stuff happens, where a very memorable song is introduced, but it's not like every single moment of this movie is you know covered in tinsel. So just be ready for that. What are the chances I've heard of this movie? I'll tell you this. If you haven't heard the movie, you absolutely know the song that is introduced in it. I'll say that much. Great. All right. Hit me. The movie from 1944 is Meet Me in St. Louis. Yeah. I know that name. Starring Judy Garland, directed by Vincent Minnelli, who would become her husband. Um, And it is set at the turn of the 20th century. It is about uh, a family and their excitement over the fact that the World's Fair is going to be coming to St. Louis. And the the sorrow of the possibility that they might all wind up moving to New York City before the great event happens. And during the uh, memorable holiday segment of this film, Judy Garland to her young co-star Margaret O'Brien sings have yourself have a yourself merry a merry little christmas. christmas there it is uh so yeah so uh, brand's ever seen this movie and now he's going to see it i've heard her sing it so okay well, that's a chart so there you go <laughs> uh, i'm excited about it i mean it's, it's Trudy garland what's not to yeah. love you know it's this was great. this was considered her first adult role even though she's she's playing like you know older teenager but um it was definitely uh you know a move forward from like playing you know Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and and other sort of like more juvenile parts she was doing up until that point. And at least it's uh it's uh, streaming which is great news for for everybody. Oh good. Yes. I, I know. I, again, my apologies about last time when I when I made the list, remember the night was streaming but it just it just disappears sometimes when you turn around too long. It'll be back, everybody. It'll be it back. It um, all right. I'm going to go watch it. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about Meet Me in St. Louis <laughs> uh, here on Deck the Hallmark. And we're back. <laughs> we did it. We watched it. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I, I know why I wasn't cast. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> but I like to think. If they that, do a remake, you know, they, I mean, got your number. That's exactly right. Um, also, I mean, I know now why you like this movie. Oh, so <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I forget about that between viewings that there are two <laughs> characters in this movie named Alonzo, but they spell it with a Z. Yeah. Well, the first uh, like I, I, I felt like I was like, did they say Alonzo? <laughs> <laughs> sure, it doesn't strike me as a 1940s name. Uh, well, it's a 1903. They usually re- abbreviate right. it to Lon, which I have never, ever done. <clears throat> La- oh, I like no, that. No, 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 no. That sounds don't, sexy, don't even, start, don't even start wrapping that around your head. Ooh, that is not Lon. happening. No. Save that Let's- for Lon Chaney. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk uh, Mimi and St. Louis. Um, Alonzo. Give us a little synopsis, if you don't mind. I'm not going to do the magic that you did last oh, week. Oh, man. And you're not, I, 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 I demand the sound bed. Okay, one fine, fine. You know what? I'll, <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it Thank for you. you. I appreciate it. You got to do a whole thing. Meet me in St. Louis, originally aired. Oh, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> Meet me in St. Louis, originally played in theaters in 1944, and it went a little something like this. 
That is not the right song. No, we're not doing deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. A little something like this. The 1904 World's Fair is still a year away, but the Smith family of St. Louis can hardly wait for this international event to come to their hometown. In the meantime, they've got plenty to keep them busy. Second oldest daughter, Esther, played by Judy Garland, has fallen in love with John Truitt, who has just moved in next door. Oldest daughter, Rose, hopes she'll soon be engaged. And youngest daughter, Tootie, always manages to get herself in trouble, no matter what the season. Just before Christmas, Mr. Alonzo Smith drops a bombshell. He's accepted a promotion that will take him to New York City, and the whole family will be leaving St. Louis right after Christmas. The the rest of the Smith family be ready to leave behind their lives, their friends, and their beloved hometown? There's a Christmas ball, and they're going to make big decisions, and it's all going to work out, and that was Meet Me, Meet me in St. Louis. Mailed it, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Now that makes everything better. What can I tell you? Yeah, that's true. It really does. Especially that banjo. For sure. Oh, yeah. Really? It was, I was trying a new thing. It didn't the work. country bear right. jamboree. <laughs> I was trying a new thing. Um, all right. Let's talk about it. Uh, yes. Alonzo, I'll let you go uh, first. This was your 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 choice. So tell me yeah. why you, you chose it. And then, you know, upon rewatching what your thoughts were. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a movie where uh, I certainly realized over the time that I was doing the book that there are there are Christmas movies that are very much like centered on Christmas that they all take place, you know, in, in the last half of December and it's all the discussions are about Christmas and all the decorations are about Christmas. And then there are other movies in which, you know, it's a year in the life and part of that year is Christmas. And then however significant that Christmas sequence does or doesn't maybe make it a Christmas movie. Uh, that movie hustlers a couple years ago with Jennifer Lopez um, has a pretty big, Christmas sequence in it. A lot of people are like, oh, does this count as a Christmas movie? And I'm like, if you think it does, sure. It's a that's a very there's a lengthy sequence that involves like gift exchange and a big tree and all that stuff. So yeah, this is a movie that starts in the summer of 1903 and ends in the spring of 1904. So there is a Christmas sequence in the film. But it is a huge, huge, very important Christmas sequence, if for no other reason than Judy Garland introduces the world to the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. And so while this is not as like steeped in holiday, 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 the way like, you know, Hallmark movies have trained us to accept, uh, I think it absolutely still counts as a Christmas movie. I think that when we think about this movie, we don't think about the Halloween segment, although the Halloween segment is funny and charming. We don't think about you know, summer or other things that happen in the film, we think about Christmas. So what you're saying is that Hustlers <laughs> is the meet me in St. Louis of our day. Basically, yes. <laughs> that's what I got out equivalent. of everything you said. That's what I got. <laughs> Hustlers. Um, yeah, so this is what I'll say. I loved the Christmas part of this movie. Mm. Um the 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 snowman which i what were they made out of i don't know ah, but yeah. it certainly wasn't snow especially when she's breaking them they were and pretty she's solid just, she is just whacking that one and it is not budging <laughs> god bless her she uh man she was a mess um but gosh have yourself a merry little christmas what like just watching it it's just so it's so good yeah and i uh, everybody too uh, was it tootie tootie <laughs> yeah <laughs> She's everybody li like listening and watching her uh, uh, Judy Garland sing it because it's just so good. Uh, yeah, and if you're not if you're not moved by it, there's something wrong with you, Dan. Uh, yeah, so see your doctor. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, yeah, it's funny because like that's that is a song that has become a staple, but a lot of the people who sing it change the lyrics a little right. bit, so it's lot not like poignant which it is in the film like it and apparently the original the, the, the sort of hollywood lore the original version of the film was e the 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 song was even sadder oh wow it was like you know have yourself a merry little christmas it may be your last or something like that <laughs> and judy garland was like i am not singing this to console a girl a young girl who is upset like no the, the, the rewrite please and so so we got to where where it is now but yeah a lot of people who cover it will uh will leave out you know uh, muddle through and, and the sort of the, the, the more kind of 
heart wrenching uh, uh, things in that song. And, you know, I think there are some really good covers over the years. My husband is like, Judy, and I don't want to hear anybody else do it. Oh, I, don't, I don't, I don't, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Gerald, yeah, they're fine. They're great. I just, this is Judy's song. Judy sings this. <laughs> it's so interesting, too. There's something about Judy, Judy's voice. Yeah. That it's not typically the type of voice, like overly, like, I don't know. There's something about her voice that is just really special that yeah, I love. It, it, it's not pretty, but it's so packed with emotion, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, like there are certain, uh, you know, uh, take her seriously or not. Karen Carpenter, I think, shares a lot of that quality. There's something mm -hmm. in that voice that's just like this sort of honey coated dagger, <laughs> where it, it's like it, it just you, it just gets you, you know, when you when you listen to her. And it like invites you in somehow to, mm -hmm. like, you just feel like you're there when you're listening to her. The th thing that strikes me as I'm watch, like, I I get sad when I watch Judy. Because I know of all of the things that like were happening to her sure. due to the system. And it's just tough watching it, you know, knowing all the things that were done to her and at her expense, which is just unfortunate. Uh, the Christmas sequence is fantastic in this movie. Uh, I think it's my least favorite of the ones that you've brought. I was a, a, a little bit uh, bored uh, waiting for the Christmas. Like I, I liked the first part and then I was like, all right, here we are. We're happening now. And then Christmas <laughs> came along and I'm like, yes, this is it. <laughs> And the Christmas stuff did not disappoint. Best part of the the, the movie by far. Now, if you uh, had watched this out of the context of this show where we're talking about Christmas movies and just sort of taking it at, at, as a movie at face value, would that have, would you have liked it more? I don't think so. No, okay. I, I think, uh, I think knowing that Christmas was coming kept, was what was keeping me engaged. Uh, the trolley so, song didn't keep you engaged. The trolley song was fine. Yes. Brand. The, trolley, the trolley song was fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. The trolley song, song is like a classic of American cinema. Come on. Yeah, the trolley song was fine. Oh, oh man. I weep for your generation. <laughs> it's no hustlers. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, J Lo it, is it, our Judy. Yeah, that's right. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, inviting is one word you could use. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, what? She has a new movie coming out. Who's that with Owen Wilson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen it yet, but it's coming Man, up. Yeah, <clears throat> I can't wait. Like, it just looks like something. <laughs> What what I think is really cool about this movie, I mean, there's obviously it, it has an interesting kind of place in the the Judy Garland context. Like this was sort of her bridge from juvenile roles to you know leading lady. This was kind of this was her most grown up part to date, even though she's still playing a teenager. Um, and she wound up marrying Vincent Minnelli, who directed the film, and you know they're Liza's parents. Um, nice. But I think the movie itself uh, is really interesting in that. For one thing, it's not like super plot driven. It's really just kind of like right. a year in the life of this family. It's ensemble these, driven for sure. Yeah. And these things happen and, you know, we just kind of move along. It's, you know, it's a nostalgia piece even for then. I mean, this is a movie set in 1943 that was, came out in 1944. Ni sorry, 1903, they came out in 44, right. which would be like making a movie about 1981 now, basically. So for a lot of people in the audience, that that era was not, you know, was, was something they had some firsthand memory of. I also think it's really interesting in that the men have very little to do in this movie and really only exist as the objects of desire of the women and sort of prizes to be won by the women. I'm speaking mainly about Warren Sheffield and, and John Truett. Like they're barely, they barely exist as characters. And usually in movies of this era and, and, and the current era, you will see movies where it's all about the men and the men's drives and the men's desires and wants. And the female characters are sort of just there as, prizes to be won and so the here the men are like i want him to i want him to kiss me i want him to ask me to marry him but I, who is he we don't know we barely spend any time with him he doesn't matter it's the women's stories that are important here they, even uh, even the dad in this movie all he does is make like a terrible decision that he then has to fix like that's it that's all he does the guys have so little to do in this movie that uh, when uh, is it Warren comes in and says we're getting we're getting married and that's uh -huh. the, that's it. The dad hasn't even met him. Doesn't know it. Doesn't know who this guy is. <laughs> exactly. That's how little they have to do in this movie. They don't even know who each other are. It's like, the, gra well, the grandpa actually, I will say, gets he he he's he a gets, delight. He gets some great moments. Yes. Yeah. So in short, my least favorite of the three 
that I've seen so far. Okay. I still enjoyed it. Good. But I, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. It was Judy Garland's great. That's all, that's all I'll say. She's a she is. She, she is. She is. is. There's a reason. There's a reason why she's a legend, and uh, she's just so good. Like, yeah, and- uh, th- this is one of the handful of movies that, like, you absolutely have to see. Like, I think everybody, you, you, you are born in this country having seen The Wizard of Oz somehow. Like, it's just part yeah, of our yeah, collective yeah. DNA. But if you want to move past that, this is definitely one to check out. Give me a quick history lesson on uh, uh, color, Technicolor, and hmm. so. Because Wizard of Oz came out uh, like what thirty nine, five, so five, five years, years before, this. Yeah. before this, and there was color. Was there color in the original? Oh and yeah, it, it was always, the, the, yeah. the middle of the Wizard of Oz has always been in color. Yes, right. <laughs> okay, so that's in color, and then forty. She's in this movie, and uh, there's color. Yeah, uh, I mean, but then there there's were... movies made in between that obviously we watch them. They're not sure. So when, wh- why was it such a, a a sparse thing, and when did it become? The uh, norm? I mean, Technicolor obviously was was expensive, and it was you know it, it was a more complicated process. It, you had to light it differently. Like Judy Garland was no doubt sweating buckets, having to wear all those pinafores and all those layers under the very bright lights required to shoot a Technicolor movie. Um, you know, there were experimental stabs at color like very early in film. And then in the, in the um, thirties, you get a mo- the movie called Becky Sharp that comes out. That's based on the novel Vanity Fair. And that's technically thought of as like the first sort of color film. And by, you know, 39 is Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. So like it, right. it you could do it. It, 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 it the, the technology existed, but, uh, everything wasn't automatically just going to be in color by default. And so, you know, you look at the, you know, like musicals, yes. And obviously sort of big splashy historical epics like Gone with the Wind. But uh, for the most part, like a lot of movies are still in black and white and Technicolor is sort of a selling point. It's like 3D, you know, uh, but it's not the norm yet. Um, and it's really like up and up through like the 60s, people are still kind of doing black and white as a fallback, you know, like I think the last black and white movie to win best picture at the Oscars before Schindler's list was the apartment, which comes out in 1960. And in the sixties, you're still seeing like smaller dramas, uh, you know, shot in black and white, but, but color is more and more becoming the, 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 the standard, especially as, more and more people own color televisions. I think that right. probably, I think that drives the industry to be like, well, we need to, you know, because eventually we want to sell these movies to TV and people don't want to see black and white on television or whatever. Uh, but in this era, it's, it, they're kind of holding it off for like splashier productions like this. And so this is, this is MGM, like, when they're really rocking, you know, uh, a lot of the old studios sort of had their signature thing. Like Universal had the monsters and Warner Brothers had the gangster movies and MGM obviously had the musicals. And there's a producer named Arthur Freed who produced this film, who uh, had started out as a songwriter uh, and then became a producer. And he is responsible for when we think about like the great MGM musicals, like he was the guy behind singing in the rain. He's the guy behind Gigi and a lot of these other films like, the freed unit as it was called, because it was like him and certain directors that he worked with and certain cinematographers and like the whole kind of crew of, you know, people that, that made these films happen. Uh, the freed unit is sort of thought of as like the gold standard of the classic Hollywood musical. And this is one of the films that came out of that period. Gotcha. So was it, is it like, kind of like, uh, like IMAX, like you need, you needed special equipment, <laughs> it's a lot more expensive to shoot it. That yeah. Type I of mean, deal. I mean the, you didn't in a theater the way you right. do with IMAX right, yes, right, right, right. on the production side. Absolutely. It was because you had to, you had to light it a certain way and then you had to develop it a certain way. And it was, yeah, it was definitely, it was going to, it was going to add a chunk to your budget. And so you did that for movies that, you know, sort of required that level of spectacle where you really needed it to sort of make up for the fact of, of what it was going to cost. I love it. Thank you for the history lesson. Sure. And, and, and what you see in that period of Technicolor also, like if you notice at the, like at the big, at the house party that they throw for, for lawn going away to Princeton, like all the girls dresses are in different shades. Yeah. You know, like everybody, like there's the, the, there's the, the purple girl and the beige girl and the red girl, like, like, and, and around this time, like MGM does a three musketeers remake with like Gene Kelly and, and Lana Turner. And like each musketeer has a color, 
you know, they're always color coded. And that, that was sort of an early Technicolor thing of like, look at the, look at the rainbow here, you know? <laughs> and like, this is also how you're going to keep these characters straight. You're just going to remember, Oh, she's the one in Brown and she's the one in blue, you know? Funny. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, let's do the, uh, the, the Christmas cheer. Uh, where does this uh, land for you on a sliding scale of Christmas? Hi. I mean, I, I know it doesn't deliver, you know, from stem to stern the way that you might like in these films. But I think when it's when it's giving you Christmas, it is giving you Christmas. You know, the uh, the snow, the gigantic old, you know, style of trees that are that more sort of like they aren't perfectly conical, you know, which I love in old movies. Um uh, how much of the, that the, that section of the plot revolves around Christmas itself in terms of, you know, when we're moving and the ball and, uh, you know, uh, 2D and the presents and all that stuff. So I would I would go eight, even though it's it's not uh, even though it's just a percentage of the film. I think when they do it, they 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 lean in hard. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think like as a whole. It's like, you know, 40% of the movie. So you can yeah. give it a four. But like the Christmas that's there is is hardcore. I mean, there's a there's a part when they go from like the dance to getting to the room where she sings, where there's a the the score, it's like an instrumental Christmas, but it's like a montage of different Christmas songs. Mm. It goes in between like three different songs. And it's <laughs> just the way that it is the music is just so good it's so good it's, it's the soundtrack inside brand's head oh all the time man no <laughs> doubt it was so good obviously have yourself a merry little christmas like you can't beat that yeah so like the christmas that's there uh, is real good and i'll just say this like kudos i've never thought to do this before but they all wake up in the middle of the night and they realize it's christmas and so instead, why not of, <laughs> instead of going back to sleep, they say, let's just knock this out right now. Let's just do this thing. Let's open presents. So kudos to them for just, you know. Weirdly enough, that's that's kind of how my family used to do it. When I was a little kid, I would go to bed waiting for Santa. And then, like, they would wake me up at, like, 2 o'clock in the morning. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the idea was, like, Santa just came. And I think also because my, my mom would usually and, and other people in my family would go to midnight mass. So they would go, go to minimum as come home, wake me up. We'd open presents and then we'd all collapse. Okay. I can see that. I can see that as somebody who doesn't go to midnight mass. If, if you think I'm waking my kid up at 2, 2 a.m., you lost your mind. But it if did, I'm already up, I can see. Uh, it's can yeah, see it's it funny. Now. Like the next, the next generation happened. Like my siblings started having kids. They're like, oh, no, no, we're not waking our kids up in the middle of the night. You like, don't we're mess not, with that. We're not messing with their sleep schedule. Like that's not happening. You don't mess with sleep. What is wrong with your parents? <laughs> <laughs> I was the I was the seventh kid. By that point, they were like, whatever. You know? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, all right. Let's recommend something. Yes. Watching this. What kind of comes to mind, uh, Alonzo, that maybe it's something else I haven't seen uh, that you think of when you're watching this movie? Well, like I was saying before, I think this is this is a if you're looking at the the the, you know, sadly uh, brief, but still like, you know, incredibly dense career of Judy Garland. Uh, this movie, I think, kind of marks a really important middle point between like Wizard of Oz and what would come later. And so then I think to sort of check out the the the, the back end where she really matures into a really powerful. I mean, not that she ever wasn't, but I mean, like as a, as, as a, a full on mature adult actress and singer, um, I would say the 1954 A Star is Born, um, which was the it was the first time that story had been done as a musical. It, it's been done as a musical ever since. Um, but she is extraordinary in that film. And in fact, um, Dave, you know, who is now like super into Judy Garland, did, kind of blew her off for a long time because he's like, all right, yeah, Wizard of Oz is great, but it was kind of a cliche among gay men from the sixties onward. They're like, Oh, you worship Judy Garland, you know? And so he, of course, being a contrarian, is like, I don't, not, not interested. And then I showed him a star is born. And she does a song in that movie called The Man That Got Away, which is just a gut-wrenching, like, dude has left me number. She shoots it in one take, live on the set. And he said it was like watching punk rock. Like, that she mm. is so nakedly emotional and lurching toward the camera and, like, not filtering anything and just giving you so much raw emotion 
that it, it it blew him away. And then he went back and, you know, thanks to Turner Classic Movies, went and has seen every single movie she ever made. So wow. I that's the movie that, I, that that converted him. I'm I still haven't even seen every movie she's ever made, but I'm a huge like Star is Born 1954 is my favorite of all the versions. I think they all have things going for them. But her uh her that that number particularly, but the movie in, in general, George Cukor directed it. It's it's stunning and powerful and still holds up and was chopped to bits and then thankfully restored in the 80s so you can see it at its full length and uh it's it's really great that's what's crazy about judy is she's was worked to the bone but like she's incredible like if if that if that was me i would just be all mopey like i would i wouldn't show up like i'd be like all right i'll come but you're not gonna get my best like she does it yeah, no, no, no. I mean, she, she, she was doing this literally from infancy and just, you know, like just would, and, and, you know, obviously, yes, the, the later she got, like her work became erratic or her showing up on time became erratic because, you know, they'd been pumping pills into her at MGM from a very young age. Right. Uh, but like in a star is born, even though she was going through these same issues that would plague her for most of her life, like she and her then husband, Sid Luff were producing this movie. It was sort of her, uh, she she was kind of getting to run the show more than she had in the past. She wasn't she wasn't under contract at a studio. This was like her baby, and you know it was kind of it was not long after she had gotten fired from MGM, and it was sort of her opportunity to kind of show the world, look, I'm capable of this. I can do this. And she was robbed of an Academy Award that year, if you ask me. But the robbed. Oscars almost never get it wrong. So why should this be any different? <laughs> is there another you? is there another like year in the life movie that comes to mind that's uh, similar to this hmm uh oh man you got you put me on the spot uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> I, I i'm sure there are and if y'all want to leave some in the comments um I, i'm just uh, it's one of those things the second you asked me my brain went what uh, you know so yes there there are i just can't think of what they are at the moment <laughs> It's a really uh, cool way to tell a, a story without, like, like you said, it's not heavy on the plot. Oh, like it's actually, just, yeah, go ahead. There's a British movie from a couple of years ago, directed by the great Mike Lee, called Another Year, and it is about a year in the life of this couple and their family and friends, and it's terrific. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's like it doesn't have to be like life itself is a it's a plot. So like just seeing somebody yeah. evolve over the course of a year. Uh, in and of itself is plot enough like you don't Absolutely. have to go crazy so uh kudos to that um all right i'm ready to tell everybody okay the headphones what, what are, we're gonna... are coming off we are going to watch the 1998 classic starring jonathan taylor thomas i'll be home for christmas I don't know if Alonzo's ever seen it. I was trying to think of one that he probably wouldn't have seen. I think this is one that could have passed him by. We'll see. Um, all right, that's it. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. I'm excited because I tried to I look through the list and I <laughs> I think I maybe found one that you would have just let pass you by. Okay. So that's the one that we're going with. So I'm excited about that. We'll just see about that. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> um, until then, Alonso, may I be the first to wish you, buddy, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Deck the Hallmarks of Bramble Jam podcast. It's presented by Philo TV. It's produced by Brandon Gray and recorded live in, yeah, that Greenville, South Carolina. Set decor is by Plum at Haywood Mall. For more information on Deck the Hallmark, you can go to deckthehallmark.com. For more information on Bramble Jam podcast network, you can go to bramblejampodcast.com. Come.